Behind the Shades. My name is Lana Makara, and I am a published author. I'm a ghostwriter. That's how I make a living. I write books for people, and I am all over social media, <laughs> Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> you name it. Um, that's kind of where I hang out because that's how I connect with people in my business. So... Perfect. There's one area of social media that I've yet to master. and Maybe you can help me. That's Twitter. I just can't make it work. But maybe after this, you can give me a few tips. Twitter is kind of a puzzle to me. And I have my LinkedIn automatically posting to Twitter. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. So take us from the beginning of this, because we're going to talk about divorce and how you rebuild your life. So Tell your story. How did you come across this um, group of people that you're helping as it pertains to the divorce that you went through? Wow. Um, I speak a lot on podcasts about this topic because I have a heart to help other people because I was so lost. I, I just felt like I was drowning and I didn't know how to get my feet back on solid ground again. And so I'm not a coach, you know, like I would coach someone. Uh, I'm a book person, but I like to reach out to help people when I have the opportunity to do that. So that's, you know, that's where I'm coming from, a heart of compassion to help others. I found my way through and you can too, but it takes a little bit of um, thought. It takes help. It's not a DIY project because people need each other. We all need each other. So that's one major thing. For me, I never thought I would ever be divorced. I was married for 30 years. Usually people think, oh, we made it to 20. We're good now, you know. Oh, we made it to 30. We're good. And in year number 30, I left him. He was shocked. But I had been miserable for at least 20 years before I left him. So if there are any men listening, it would be a good time to say, if your wife tells you that she's unhappy, you might be smart to listen to her and find out why and see what can be corrected because she may be able to stick it out for a long time, but eventually she won't be able to. And that's what happened with me. So um, yeah, I never dreamed I would be divorced. And by the way, my husband is a pastor. He was a pastor. I was a pastor's wife who left her pastor husband. Now that caused a little storm in the church. <laughs> but the truth is there'd been a lot of storming going on at home for years <laughs> before it went public. <laughs> because, you know, the pastor's family has to be perfect. And so we all dressed up pasted on a smile, but there's trouble underneath there, big trouble. And uh, so it was unexpected. I was a stay-at-home mom, didn't have a job all those years. And so when I left him, I was more than 50 years old. I was 51 and a half, something like that. And 51 years old with no work resume for 30 years. How was I ever going to earn a living? If you look at the job market, someone in their 50s with no job resume, what was I going to do? And that's really how I woke up the next day and looked at my, at my life and said, what am I going to do now? 
And let me ask you, Lana, a question about that. There's people out there on the other side who may say, you've reached the 10 year mark. Many divorces don't make it 10 years. Sorry, many marriages don't make it 10 years because divorces seem to happen around that time, right? Like sometimes there's children, the children are old enough to understand. And we are a different person in our 20s and 30s than we are, let's say, in our late 30s and 40s, definitely, right? As we grow. And you made it to 30 years and you realize this isn't for me anymore because the last 20 of that 30 you were not happy, right? And there's other factors, that, and there are factors that are contributing to that. How did you maintain this marriage when in year 10, you were not happy, but yet you continued forward 20 more years? I had seven children. That was really my big why. I had seven children. I knew he was not the person who would support the family if he wasn't living there. And I couldn't support these kids on my own. I couldn't man manage working with seven children in the house. There was, I was trapped. I felt trapped. Um, a lot of the times I'll, I would push it away. You know, it wasn't like the whole 20 years I was sitting there like, oh, I've got to get out of here. No, I'd push it away stick it in a box, put it over there. You know, that was the kind of thing I did. We'd have a blow up and then I'd, I'd be like, God, what am I going to do? And then I'd sit down and, you know, look at my options. And I'd be like, no, can't, can't do anything right now. And I'd put it in a box and put it away, you know, and I didn't leave because I was angry. I actually left because of a conversation. That was a God moment conversation I had with a friend of mine that I hadn't heard from in 20 years. It was someone that was very close to me when I was in my 20s. She was having children, I was having children. She had eight, I had seven. And so we were best friends. I mean, I would babysit her kids, she'd babysit mine. Who's gonna babysit for seven kids? I mean, you're just not gonna go out and find a person. <laughs> uh, but our children were the same ages and for them it was play day. You know, if she was watching my kids, they were having a great time. So, um, you know, that was a friendship that I had that went deep and then we moved and then she moved and I lost track of her over these 20 years. We both moved a few times and I got this email and it was from her, but it was like a group email, you know, one of those newsy emails that people send out sometimes, uh, it wasn't to me alone. But I, it came in, I was looking at my email and it came in, it was like two minutes old. And I thought, she's at home. So I looked in there and got her phone number and I called her up and she picked up. There was one other time I called her a few years before she didn't pick up and I, I lost it. But this time she picked up. So we talked, you know, her, her eight, my seven, that <laughs> took a while. And then I said, you know, I'm having some problems because my brother-in-law moved in and I just can't manage it. It's just like too much for me. My brother-in-law is here and it was almost like my husband and his brother teamed up on me and I couldn't get through it. I, there was nothing I could do. And she said to me, that's what's wrong with you. I've been wondering this whole time, what's wrong with you? She said, you're depressed. And I'm telling you something else. You know, she was like giving me tough love here. She said, you're going to have a breakdown, girl. You're going to have a breakdown. I can hear it in your voice. You get out of there. And I was like, what? My friend was a very conservative Christian. And she just told me to leave my pastor husband. I couldn't believe it. I was in shock and I got off the phone and I sat down on the bed and I thought, oh my goodness. And I realized that I had been coping and coping and coping until I backed myself up in a corner and I couldn't back up anymore. I'd gone as far as I could go. 
And I, at that moment, I kind of had like a vision. It wasn't really like a vision, but it was like a picture in my head that came up and I saw myself lying on the bed in a fetal position, all curled up and I couldn't speak like totally breakdown. Right. And he came in the room and looked at me on the bed and said, are you going to get up and make dinner? And when I didn't answer, he went out and shut the door. And in my spirit, I knew that's what was going to happen if I didn't leave. And so three days later, I left. It took me three days to get myself together to realize what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What am I going to take? What am I going to tell him? And, you know, pull it all together. And I was bawling the whole time. I cried for three days. I still had four kids at home, but they were all over 18. They were young adults living at home. Nobody was still in school. And they were on their way. You know, it wasn't like I was leaving toddlers, but hey, they're my kids. You know, I not only left him, I left my four kids in that house. And but I felt like I was escaping with my life. If I didn't do this, they were going to put me in the ground. So that was really, it came to a crisis moment. And he was so oblivious, you know, that, well, I told him I'm going to see my sister and stay with her a while. I'm not doing well. I'm not handling things. I'm not coping well. My sister is a psychologist. And I was telling the truth. I went to my sister and my thought was she'll help me find somebody. She'll help me find a therapist that can help me. And so I drove 12 hours, got to my sister's house the next, that night. And I knew in my heart, I was never going back, but I didn't tell him that at the time because I knew he would guilt trip me and I would never have the strength to leave. The only way I could have the strength was to not tell him right then. I told him later, a couple weeks later. So that was my whole worldview shifted. I mean, how could God let that happen? You know, that's what was in my mind. I was serving God all these 30 years. We were missionaries overseas. We served God. And we helped people our whole lives. And here I am alone, basically kicked to the sidewalk. And I have to figure my life out now. So it was mind blowing for me to find myself in that situation. I never wanted to be a wage earner and go to work. I was very happy being a stay at home mom, taking care of my family. That was my life. I was writing books. But that was my hobby. My family was my life. So, Lana, let me ask you a question here in regards to that, because you mentioned some key terms. You mentioned that you felt trapped. You mentioned that you're coping with what you're going through. And anytime someone's in a relationship, these are characteristics of the relationship that they don't want to be going through. Right? They don't want to feel like they're trapped in their marriage or in their relationship. They don't want to feel like they're coping with the person that they're dealing with. So a question that I would have for you. So what was going through your mind when you decided that, hey, I need to step away from this because I want to make sure that I protect my peace of mind as well as my body, my soul, my everything. It was, um, it was kind of just a fuzzy feeling in my head. I was so physically exhausted that I had no more energy to give. I was, I had six men in the house. The four, four of my children that were home were all men, my husband and his brother. I had six men in the house and I was doing all the laundry 
all the cleaning, all the cooking. I was doing all the work. The only thing I didn't do was mow the yard, but I did everything else. And they were working jobs, you know, and off with friends. Like, you know, my kids, when they were little, I made them do chores. They washed the dishes. They did, you know, but hey, now, you know, 22 years old, see you later, mom, heading off to the gym, you know. Then he brings his uh, gym clothes home and they go on the pile by the washer. <laughs> Times four. So, yeah, I was just really physically totally exhausted. I couldn't keep up with everything. I just couldn't work morning till night. And so I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew I had to take it one day at a time. Today, I'm driving to my sister's house. The next day, I'm going to sleep. I have to rest. The day after that, I'm going to see the therapist. That was my life. That was how I was managing my life at that point. I couldn't even look two days ahead. I remember my sister had this big, it was a giant coffee table book with pictures in it. It was Norman Rockwell and he had all these pictures from the old days, like the 1940s or something. And I, I sat for hours and just looked at the pictures in that book. That's all I did. That's all I could think I have enough presence of mind to do. I couldn't even pick up a book and read it or anything. I'm looking at a picture book. That's what I was doing. So I did that for about two weeks at my sister's house. They both work. I was there alone all day. It was really so good for me to just be quiet and sleep and sleep and sleep. I had about 30 years of fatigue <laughs> to sleep on. <laughs> so that, that was really it. And then eventually um, I started, my mother had a business and I started working for my mother in the office to get a little money together. Cause I had $200, that's all I had. And I had to put gas in the tank, right? to get down there to South Carolina. So um, I started working for my mother two days a week, filing and doing computer data entry and stuff like that. So that was, you know, little by little, I started to pull my life together just a little at a time. Now my mother's a whole nother story. My mother's extremely abusive and she was one of the biggest trials in my life to think about working in her office. Are you kidding? But, you know, I made it for six weeks. I only worked for my mother for six weeks, but it did get me, you know, stabilized a little bit until I could figure out something else to do. Was there any hesitation in the decision that you made to end it because of the presence of the church? You're married to a pastor, as well as you may not have the type of support system that you wanted at that point in time. Yes. At first I thought I'm just going to be separated. I'm not going to get a divorce. I didn't believe in divorce and I didn't want a divorce. I just wanted to live apart from him. I couldn't live with him anymore. He was too abusive, too dismissive. And I could not, I couldn't do it anymore, but I thought I'll just, you know, there are people who are separated for 20, 30 years and they're still married, but they just don't live together. You know, I figured that's what will be. That's what will happen because um, I didn't want to, you know, completely end it. But about five months later, five, six months later, I just couldn't, I just felt like you know, I've gone this far. I need to get my, I need to make a fresh start for me instead of trying to preserve the family image and all of that, that was all outside here. I was trying to maintain still. Right. Um, but I needed the closure of it. I also needed money. And by filing for divorce, there was a monthly amount that he gave it was only $500, but still, you know, I was destitute 
And I didn't get any money for over a year, about a year and a half until the divorce was decree was done, where he had to, by court order, send me money. He wasn't going to send me any money. He didn't care what kind of situation I was in. Um, the only thing he wanted for was for me to come back and keep, keep house for him, you know? So, um, yeah, that was, that was really why I ended it. I, I did it reluctantly, but I felt like I had to in order for me to be okay at that point. But in the meantime, all of my, six of my children turned away from me. Uh, they, they blamed me for leaving because I was the one who did it. I was the one who took action. And my six sons turned away from me. My daughter was at college. She wasn't really, you know, in the family thing right now. She was in college, but, and we stayed in touch, you know, calls once in a while and all that, but I didn't really have any kids with me at all. And my sons would not have any con contact with me at all uh, for the next two years. So it was a really hard time. And I went and applied for some, for a job. And I found out that I could make $9 an hour. That's all I was worth. <laughs> and I couldn't even pay my rent. You know, I had rented an old double wide trailer in the woods, <laughs> backwoods of South Carolina. As I mean, it was as far back as you can get. And it was a ramshackle old place for $600 a month. And uh, my whole budget for the month was $1,200. But I could not make that much money at $9 an hour. I couldn't do it. So I started to take in virtual assistant work. I became a virtual assistant to, because I was in, I was on the internet because of my books. I knew people. And so I just started sending out emails. Do you need any help? You know, I think I was making 15 or $20 an hour, but it was enough to get me through. I mean, I was eating ramen. I wasn't eating wild hog or anything like that, but I was, I was able to get through. Um, that period of time until I could get, you know, myself together a little better to make another plan. What were some of the changes that you would have wanted to see if you could have maintained that marriage with your ex? It would have been really nice if we could have gone to marriage counseling. One of the problems with being in a, in a marriage with a pastor is they have their reputation to maintain. And with him, he was against any type of psychology or therapy that didn't have, that wasn't from someone in our circle, in our church circle. For example, another pastor in a town across, you know, across the way, um, we could have gone to him, but, uh, Hey, that guy is my, was my ex-husband's buddy. And I'm not going to go sit in there with his buddy and have both of them double team on me. I already had that at my house. <laughs> I didn't need to do that in the pastor's office. So I really had no alternatives for, you know, a, an objective third party to go to for help. I couldn't talk to any of the church people at all. I had some friends there, but I could never tell them what was going on. Um, I think that would be the one thing, you know, having a support circle to be honest with and also to get some help. We, he needed help. I needed help. And this wasn't just a personality difference. He has personality disorders, four of them, that he was hiding. And there was nothing I could do as his wife to change anything in that very rigid um, presentation that he was in. So I didn't know all that then. I, I found out later when I went into therapy. 
And my therapist was trying to help me unravel what happened. And then, you know, this DSM-5 stuff started coming out. I had no idea about that. I just knew he was extremely stubborn and very uh, passive aggressive and mean. He was very mean to me in ways where I couldn't nail him down. Like, for example, he worked at the post office during the week when he wasn't pastoring. And so I gave him a manila envelope to take to the post office. I needed it to go to the mail and it needed to go in and be weighed. So I handed him this manila envelope. He took it off to work. I figured that was done. It was something important to me. And a week later, I get in the car and there's a manila envelope in the floor, stepped on, dirty. People have been walking on it with their shoes. So what am I going to say? Hey, buddy, you forgot my thing. You didn't mail my, my envelope. And he's going to say, hey, I forgot. I was busy. I was going to work. I had other things on my mind. It was too much. I just, you know, got under there. I didn't see it. All these excuses. That's how he acted to me. He was never accountable. And so if I would bring these things to his attention, it was all my fault. What are you doing? You're putting me on the line. You're trying to give me trouble here. Instead of saying, you know, I'm really sorry. I apologize. Let me take that. Let me put it in a new envelope for you and take it to the post office. I know you were counting on me. That was something important that needed to get in the mail. No, no, that never happened. So, you know, a few years later, a couple of years later, I was living in a house share with someone, another woman, and she was about my age and it was my birthday. My birthday came up. Well, I wasn't used to doing anything special for my birthday. I never had anybody make a fuss over me on my birthday. Just another day, right? She sat me down. She cooked a dinner for me and waited on me like a waitress in a restaurant. And I had this feeling wash over me. 30 years, 30 birthdays. I never felt like anybody cared. That was my marriage. I know for me, when I get into a relationship, I always want to make sure that am I ready for this? Meaning that am I whole enough to be everything that I can be for this person? Because this person, at the very least, deserves someone that is capable of showing them affection, love, attention, and understanding, to name a few things. It seems that the two of you knew each other for some time and you guys were married long enough that you spent a good chunk of your life together. The person that you divorced, is that, was that the, how are they, how is that person different than the person that you met to marry? <laughs> it's so interesting. <laughs> that makes you laugh. <laughs> We met in college. We went to Christian college and he was a ministerial student. I was there as an um, education major, which I was an education major and I homeschooled my children for 25 years. I, I used my education to homeschool my kids. So the answer is he was exactly the same all the way through, but me with my rose colored glasses as a young woman, didn't want to see who he really was. He was always on stage. He was acting in the plays, all the plays at college. He had leading roles. He was singing in groups. He was a good singer. And I saw the guy on stage when he, when he said to me, I can't see you, but every two weeks we're engaged. I can't see you. We can't have any dates except for once every two weeks. I accepted that. Those were really big red flags. I had things happen at college and I would be upset and I would tell him about it. And he'd say, well, it was your fault because you did this and that and the other. It was really your fault. Instead of taking that to heart, this man doesn't even know who I am. That's not even listening to me. It's no compassion whatsoever. Um, I just went ahead. He was, a, he was going to be a preacher. It was going to be fine. It was going to be fine. We are serving God together. 
right? So therefore I have to be selfless. But what I didn't realize as that young girl, this man's a narcissist. He's not, he's not a man of God, like he says, right? He's totally self-absorbed. He has no compassion. He has no heart. He just is fulfilling this role because it gets him attention and praise. And to this day, he's still preaching. People still think he's great because when he's on stage, he looks good. He speaks well and he sings. So, you know, he's a whole deal and the church people are just crazy about him. But they didn't have to go home with him at night. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was the same. It was me. I had blinders on. And I didn't want to admit what I was getting into. I think that happens to so many of us because we don't look at it objectively and without the emotions that are involved. Because once we're emotionally involved, as you mentioned, it to a degree blinds us from what is so at times obvious to other people. And then we look back and we're like, oh yeah, I see it now, 10, 20, 30 years later. And for someone like me, I grew up in the church and I was pretty active in the church. When I look at the instructions that were given, it has to or should align with the type of marriage that's, or the type of relationship that we have, especially when it's two people who are of the cloth. Mm -hmm. How did you come to terms with um, your marriage is not reflecting what your religious ideals are? I was very depressed. I was extremely depressed. I, I couldn't understand how God could let this happen to me. And I questioned God a lot uh, at the end, not the whole time. One of the things I did, one of the ways I was able to cope for so long is I would tell God and God would take care of it. So if I had a need that wasn't being met, I would just say to God, you know, I have this need and I need you, not him, you to meet my need. And God would meet my need. Uh, sometimes he would prompt my husband to do it, or sometimes it would come from another place. But I had a direct line to God because I'm holding on to a lifeline. I'm not making it. I'm not doing well. And so I really was tapped in on that level. What happened in the church, I had to just block it out. I, I couldn't deal with that part of that disconnect part, you know, between what they thought and what I knew. Um, I just didn't go there. Now, that what didn't happen to me until after I had already gone and I had was able to start to come back, you know, into my full health. Um, I just let it be because not only were we going to lose the respect, but we were going to lose our livelihood. He was working with, that was our income. He was supplementing with the post office. But what would happen if we lost the church too? And I've heard uh, preachers, families and preachers' children talking about that quite often. They, we cannot, our children could not reveal anything because we would lose our insurance, we'd lose our income, we'd lose our house. What were we going to do then? You know, and this financial constraint is terrible. It makes you feel like a hypocrite when you're actually doing your best to stay the course and do what you should do. But there's a problem here and nobody can address it because if you do, you're going to be punished with, you know, being shown the door. So, of course, I, I, we were in a very conservative church. We were in a church that believed in no makeup. Women could not cut their hair, no pants. We were in a very conservative Baptist church. It isn't like that in all, all churches are not like that. But the one we were in was, and then I was married to a very strict 
pastor. He was a very strict, he wouldn't let anybody. We couldn't even go see a movie, you know, in the theater. Um, you know, so that was extreme. It was a very extreme situation, but I could not take on what church people thought. I could, I had too much on me. I, I mean, I was up to here. <laughs> I had to let that part go. <laughs> what, as, as we close, what's something that you'd like to share as a piece of advice to the next generation who are struggling in their marriage and they don't know if they can make it work and they're contemplating separation or even divorce? Get help get help. If you're with someone who won't go for help, you get help. If that person won't go with you, go yourself. You need outside advice, a third party who doesn't know you, doesn't know them, someone who will give you solid advice, who has training to help people. Because that what I found after I started in therapy, I was in therapy for two years, is that the good sense I heard in that office was priceless. And it was the first time I felt like somebody actually was listening to me, hearing me, and then giving me feedback that actually was something that I could take action on that would help me. So get help is number one. Don't try to, this is not a DIY project. <laughs> Don't DIY. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.